This week it is another movie that is a sports movie masquerading as an entirely different genre. It's Arena, a Charles Band science fiction film about an intergalactic boxing sport called The Arena. Don't go. You know, Rogor, there's an old saying. When it's over, it's over. And guess what? It's over. It's low budget, cheesy sci-fi Rocky in space. There's a whole lot to admire here though, a decent enough plot, some very recognisable faces and a lot of very nice practical makeup and effects. This film was one I'd seen many times as a kid and when my friend asked if I had heard of it and could I cover it, I replied, heard of it? I own it on DVD. I'm not saying it is the greatest film ever made, but if you like Rocky and cheesy 80s sci-fi, you're gonna love this. So let's just jump straight into the plot and find out why. Like I said before, this is basically Rocky in space, so if you've seen Rocky, you have an idea of what is about to unfold. We open with Horns, our champion and possible drug cheat, beating this goofy ass looking guy, I think his name is Spinner. But uh, he's not important, his manager however is. Because if you were like me and watched every single sci-fi TV show the 90s had to offer, you were going to be doing a whole lot of a Rick Dalton pointing meme throughout this movie's first act. The first scene had me going, oh look it's Ivanova from the criminally underappreciated 90s sci-fi classic Babylon 5. Because yep, Claudia Christian is Quinn, the manager of a small stable of arena fighters and always a welcome sight in anything I see her in. One of whom gets beaten up by Steve Armstrong, a human short order cook, who is promptly fired for um, defending himself. I got nothing here as to the actual logic of these hiring and firing decisions. Steve is however played by Paul Satterfield. I didn't Paul Dalton at this guy because I have no idea who he is. Apparently he was on the uh, Bold and the Beautiful, a show I've never seen because I'm not a 50 year old Karen. Now down one fighter, Quinn violently offers Steve a chance to join a stable, but for some strange reason, seeing as he's jobless, homeless and penniless, he turns her down. By this point in the film, you are probably going to have noticed the absolutely great work that this film has put into the aliens that populate this space station. There is an absolute shit ton of variety. The alien costumes run the full gamut, from really well done fully animatronic rubber suits, which is always appreciated, through excellently done facial makeup effects to less well done stuff like guys wearing silly hats with their faces painted by whoever was standing around the set that day. A lot of them also seem to be the same costume, just painted differently, but at least an attempt was made to add variety to the cast of background characters. As someone who watches a lot of these low budget sci-fi films, this much effort is pretty rare. We even get some nice model shots of the exterior of the space station. Again, a nice little touch that adds a lot of production value to proceedings. The sets, however, really do scream. Just make it look vaguely spacey and futuristic. Throw a silver shiny sheet over the chair. It's 4038 in here already. They do give away the fact this is a low budget Empire Pictures film. Anyone who has seen another Charles Band classic, Robot Jocks, will be familiar with the aesthetic and this film possibly even reused at least one set from that film. But less about sets, let's get back to the plot. Having turned Quinn down, he wants to return to Earth and having no money follows his forearmed friend's suggestion to gamble what little money they do have left at an illegal casino. Where we once again have to get our Rick Dalton memes out because it's only Quark from the best Star Trek series ever made, Deep Space Nine. Yes, I am dying on that hill. Please fight me in the comments below about the fact that DS9 is the best Star Trek. Armin Shimmerman is Weasel, who is a humanoid weasel, I guess, and then force of all the space station's crime boss. A crime boss called Rogor who our forearm friend from earlier decided to steal a whole bunch of money from when the police raided the casino so he could clear his own debts and buy Steve a ticket back to Earth. What could possibly go wrong with stealing money from a crime boss? Well, 
get ready to do a Rick Dalton again because the crime boss is only goddamn Guldu Cat, otherwise known as Mark Alimo, another alum from DS9. They get 24 hours to pay back the money they stole or get killed leaving Steve no other choice but to join Quinn's stable of fighters. This basically brings us to the end of Act 1 and the beginning of Act 2. Anyone who knows boxing movies will know what comes next, a fight where the hero is losing miserably then makes a stunning comeback for a massive underdog victory, much to the surprise of everyone, especially here because Steve is the first human to fight in the arena in 50 years. This particular plot point about humans being incapable of fighting in the arena doesn't really make a huge amount of sense, but we're going to get to that later on. Then you have to follow that up with a montage of victories as our hero dispatches nameless and faceless challenges with absolute ease to rise up the rankings. Following that, how about a seemingly pointless love interest that comes from nowhere and seems all a little bit forced, but does lead us to an in-universe musical number, which is weirdly something I always appreciate and some very PG-13 nudity. A little bit of a twist on the usual sports movie trope though, because here she is working for Guldu Cat and poisons Steve in an attempt to stop him entering the championship fight, because Rogor controls the arena championship fights and doesn't want to lose his power over them. Which brings us to Act 3, the big championship fight with Horns. Except Steve is on his deathbed and the dog has to inject him with some anti-poison medication to save him from death, meaning uh, he won't be at 100% fighting capability. Uh, if all that isn't enough, Quark, along with another henchman, are attempting to fix the fight by messing with the computer technology that creates a handicap beam to ensure a fair fight. This really does beg the question, why exactly aren't humans able to compete in the arena if everybody is handicapped? Surely, the handicapping machine that the arena employs takes away any advantage that an alien might have had. Of course, against all the odds, Steve wins and becomes champion. The end. Well, not before Ivanova knocks the bitch who tried poisoning Steve out first. The fights themselves are entertaining enough, if a little bit forced at times, because Steve is fighting a guy with almost no mobility in a rubber suit. They try to make this look more exciting with different angles, cuts and slow-mo, but it is what it is. Never brilliant enough to be truly exhilarating, but never bad enough to be boring. The bits in between the fighting, especially the first act, I can see people finding those quite boring, but I was entertained enough by the costume and set design and Rick Daltoning every five minutes to never really feel time drag during them. Three of the main cast are all pretty big names who went on to star in some of the best sci-fi the 90s ever created, so the acting is as good as you'd expect it to be from such recognisable and talented actors. And if all that isn't enough to convince you, then though I've described this throughout as a Rocky clone, it is possibly a loose remake of a Star Trek original episode, The Gamesters of Triskelion. I ain't got much else to say about Arena, it's a good old fashioned bit of sci-fi family friendly light entertainment aimed mainly at kids, but entertaining enough for adults that they too will get a kick out of it, definitely one of Band's more high production value efforts that's for sure. If you like this then like, comment and subscribe because I will be back at some point with something entirely different.